This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Hi, I'm Chris Judd and this is Talk Your Book. Thanks very much for tuning in. Today we're joined by Aaron Yeo from OC Funds Management. Aaron, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks very much for having me, Chris. It's great to be here. And Rob Frost, I think he was the second ever uh, participant on, uh, I think it was Master of the Market back then, so I was very grateful to him and he's a legend of the uh, Australian investing landscape. What, for those that don't know, maybe tell us a little bit about OC Funds Management and how you guys look to invest there. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Chris. So OC Funds Management is a Melbourne-based small and micro cap fund manager. Uh, it's had a long history, been around for over 20 years. Uh, we're a tight-knit team of five uh, investment professionals led by Rob Frost, who um, you know very well. Um, I think we'd like to say um, we're, we're a steady pair of hands. Um, in terms of the investment approach, you know, it's really about sort of focusing on um, the next sort of generation of leaders in the, in the small and micro cap space, uh, focusing on businesses within what we call our sort of circle of competency. So, you know, we, that really means we screen out businesses with opaque business models, ones that we don't understand, and focusing on, on business that first and foremost, um, you know, we, we can get a sort of good handle over. So that tends to mean we typically focus on sort of more industrial type businesses, so in traditional sectors such as consumer, industrials, uh, technology, healthcare to some degree, but sort of probably less so in that um, biotech uh, end, end, of, uh, end of town. Uh, I think in that small caps end of the market as well, um, a focus on, on management and, and having access to management is, is a very important part of our investment process. You know, really getting to know the individuals in the business, what their motivations are, their track record. I think that's a, a pretty important sort of criteria for us. And then, you know, I, Doing the work on understanding the business, um, you know, we have a sort of six-tier sort of framework around understanding how the business fits within the industry, who their competitors are, their operating history to, through time, um, looking at the board, corporate governance. Um, so it's a pretty sort of thorough analysis on the business to really understand the competitive advantage. And then lastly, of course, you know, valuation, making sure that we're doing the work around. So try and understand what is this business worth and and not overpaying uh, effectively. And, uh, and what stock did you want to talk us through today? Yeah, so the stock that I want to talk to you today um, is John's Lean Group. Um, they're a um, integrated building services company and they specialize in, in servicing um, the sort of repairs um, and, and restoration work relating to insurance related claims for typically residential um, property. And so maybe give us the helicopter view of maybe the, the Australian business and what are the different business units in that and then the US business and then, then we might start by digging deeper into the uh, Australian business after that. Yeah, sure. So the, the Australian business, um, predominantly, um, sorry, roughly 80 to 85% of the Australian business is made of that insurance related building services work. So within this space, John's Ling's customers are, are the insurance companies think of you know your Suncorps and your IAGs when you as the individual are making a claim uh, you know say if your property is damaged these insurance companies typically will have a panel of builders uh, or building services companies who they will allocate the work to to assess the damage um, find the tradies to come on board and do the work um, and John's Ling are the largest in their space um, so um, oh, sorry. That's all right. So they're not, they're, they're not it's, it's a big economic mode being on that insurance panel, isn't it? Because the insurers are only have a, quite a narrow number of builders that can provide those services. Is that fair? Yeah, so typically it's, it's very hard to, to get on um, one of the insurance bu um, building panels. Um, you know, with John's Ling, I think their real sort of advantage is the scale within their business. Um, their ability to find tradies, so they've got a network of over 10,000 tradies across Australia. Um, they've got around 2,000 people who manage those tradies um, within their corporate businesses themselves and an office of roughly 34 uh, across Australia. So, you know, 
with the insurance companies, there could be an event that happens and a damage and a relevant claim that comes on board. John, they can call on John's Ling at any point in time to find someone to do the work for on their behalf. So being able to find someone quickly, do the job to a high level of quality, um, and to do it at an agreed rate as well, um, that provides a lot of certainty for these guys. And I think that's really why sort of John's Ling has been successful. And it's had such defensive characteristics. It's what a stock I've always wanted to buy, really like Scott Didier. Um, it's never looked cheap, but it's always just kept performing. Maybe walk through some of those defensive characteristics, obviously cost plus uh, revenue model. So they're not exposed like maybe some of the fixed cost builders, but maybe walk us through some of the other characteristics of the business that, that make it for a defensive play and one that's performed so well. Yeah, I think the first sort of um, so sort of underpinning which makes it defensive is really around the flow of work that insurance companies are getting. So each and every year there's an increased sort of frequency, severity of work um, or in terms of the claims that are coming through from these insurance companies and you've seen their sort of claims um, come, go increase year after year which is sort of increasing in the form of premiums as well and that really sort of underpins a lot of the work. I think you, more recently as well, you, you add on top of that, um, you know, inflation through the cost of repair. Uh, that as well is sort of driving the, the overall revenue pool for, for a John's Ling. So they're getting more and more work from these guys. So that industry backdrop, you know, is very defensive uh, from, from that sense. As well as that, you know, John's Ling being on these panels as well, you know, they're allocated a certain proportion of work um, sort of every year that comes through. There's roughly over 40,000 odd sort of discrete jobs that they're doing. So there's no huge sort of concentration around the jobs too. And as you mentioned, so John's Ling effectively is a project manager. They don't actually do the work themselves. They have a, a team of, or sorry, a network of over 10,000 sort of subcontractors or tradies that they can come on board, uh, you know, get them to do the work on their behalf. John's Ling will come in, assess the sort of scope of the work, they'll provide a quote to the insurance companies. They'll then um, sort of back that quote on to the tradie and they make a margin on top of that. So the work, as you say, is, is cost plus. So for instance, you know, at the moment when we're seeing you know, the cost of repair go up, they're not hurt by that because they're solely making a margin on top of that. And speaking to some private building operators, they feel in certain parts of Australia, they're being crowded out by public infrastructure works where the cost of labour is going up because there's so many jobs available in that public infrastructure building space uh, and the price of materials at times has gone through the roof as well due to that. This is not something that's an issue for John Zing because like you say it's just a cost plus model. Yeah no I don't, I don't think that's an issue for them so they can pass on the increased cost of materials and you know with regards to labour shortages I think it's something that we we hear quite sort of um, across not only this space but across Australia in general is very acute at the moment and they're not really seeing any issues with finding labour. I think the main reason being the reputation um, of the business, you know, paying tradies on time, uh, the reputation they have with the insurance companies means they're getting more and more work. So there's really a sort of defensive pipeline of work. So the tradies know that they can, you know, they want to do work for a John's Ling because they'll get paid and the work will come as well. So I think the ability to attract both insurance companies and tradies is an important aspect of the business and right now that, that business model is really shining through. And talk to us about the US business, obviously bought Reconstruction Holdings a couple of years ago now. Talk us through that purchase and, and what that business looks like compared to the Australian operations. Yeah, so post acquisition of Reconstruction Experts, which was um, I think in December 2021, the US now will be roughly a quarter of the earnings of the business. Um, the business itself was, um, you know, it's been around for quite a number of years and, and, you know, has had very strong sort of organic growth on its own, growing roughly 15% per annum. But I think under John Zling's ownership, there's really an opportunity to sort of supercharge the, the growth within the business. Um, and I think that really comes down to sort of the alignment and the culture of John Zling. Um, you know, they really drive sort of a high performance culture within their business. Uh, it's about finding the right people who are motivated to work. And I think there's, there's really some learnings they can sort of push through to that reconstruction experts. 
within reconstruction experts as well, there's real opportunity to expand beyond their addressable markets. So right now they're only in four states within the US and there's only really you know, a handful of service lines that they currently provide to their market. Um, there's opportunities to expand both in ge geographically into other states um, and also to add more service lines. So an example of that would be the MakeSafe product which Johns Ling have in Australia. So when there's, it was damaged by a certain event, Johns Ling can go into a property, make it safe, so f make it safe for, for other tradies to come in and do the work. At the moment, for instance, um, reconstruction experts don't do that. That's something they can easily sort of bring on board and there are a couple of others as well. With the US uh, opportunity as well, I, I think what makes it really attractive as well is the, the actual size of the market. Mm. Um, you know, it's multiple times the size of Australia. I think within Reconstruction Experts' existing market, um, it's roughly a 16 to $19 billion market at the moment in just that homeowners association service market. If Johns Link can expand beyond that into the broader multi-dwelling unit market, it's close to a $100 million, billion dollar US opportunity. So it's multiples the, the, the size of, of Australia and, and it's an extremely fragmented market. Reconstruction experts only have roughly one to 2% of their existing market. So it just gives you the sheer sort of scale of the enormity of, this, of the opportunity. And the John Zing founder, Scott Diddy, has moved over to America to run that business unit. Does that sort of speak to how important they're treating the American market? Yeah, no, I think so. So I think, um, you know, when you meet Scott, he, he's a really passionate individual and I think the business and the success of John's Ling is really testament to Scott and his ability to build a team around him. I think the culture is a real sort of hallmark of this business. You know, Scott's ability to find people who are motivated and at the same time provide them with equity options to align them within, you know, to, to grow within the business with him is a huge sort of draw card and, and a huge sort of driver of success. So I think the fact that Scott's going in there um, to the US to, to base himself you know, for, for a reasonable chunk of the year really shows how important he thinks this opportunity is. He's pretty much stepped away from the Aussie business to, to focus on the US, you know, building the team there, helping sort of grow relationships within the US, um, and I guess you know, provide you know, his insights around strategy. I, I think it just shows you how enormous they think it is. And there's some Australian companies that have ventured overseas and done brilliantly well. There's plenty more who have who've tried and failed. What are some of the risks you could see and, and what are some of the things you'll be looking out for to, to see if it's being a success or not? Yeah, look, I think to that point, the first thing I'd say about the reconstruction experts business and John Zling's sort of acquisition about it and what gives me a bit more comfort around it is the way they actually sort of found the opportunity. Um, with John's Ling, as I said before, it's all about the culture and the people within the business. Um, and, you know, with reconstruction experts and John's Ling's due diligence of it, I think effectively it took them, you know, almost a year to do the due diligence within that business because they went and spoke to every single individual within the business to really understand what their motivations and their aspirations were. And I think it was only until they got the confidence around the culture within that business did they actually decide to pull the trigger on that acquisition. So I think that, I'd probably say that's the most important thing. Um, you know, in terms of what could go wrong for them in the US, I think, look, it's, it's, a, it's a very different business from Australia. It's not within their core market. So it always presents risks. Um, you know, in terms of people within the value chain as well, the relationship for reconstruction experts in the US is not directly with insurance company. In this instance, they're dealing with homeowners associations or strata managers, so there's a bit of a different sort of relationship there. I, I think as well, the other sort of main risk that people sort of worry about it is the way that the, the contracts are priced there. Um, they're quite short dated in nature, so I think it kind of removes a bit of the risk, but they're not on a cost plus basis. So there is a little bit of a risk that, you know, there could be inflation that gets passed through. But, you know, the flip side is it gets sort of repriced every sort of 30 to 60 days when the work is, you know, when the job is ongoing. They're not 18 month projects. Yeah, they're not, you know, yeah, 18 month projects. So there's no sort of risk around that. 
So in terms of their market cap or the numbers, talk us through their market cap, what sort of numbers they did for FY22 and, and what they've got in the market for guidance for FY23. Yeah, sure, Chris. Um, yeah, so their market cap's roughly around 1.8 billion at, at the moment. Um, they did roughly 80 odd million in EBITDA um, and their guidance for this year is roughly 105 million in EBITDA. Um, typically, you know, John's Ling have a history of upgrading guidance through the year, particularly as the the pipeline for work um, continues to build and we're seeing this year um, there's a record level of catastrophe events coming through. Um, you've seen you know, with uh, the, the floods in New South Wales and Queensland as well, I think it's over a $5 billion sort of insured value in terms of um, actual sort of cat work that Johnsling has exposure to. Um, so you know, I, I'm quite confident that you know, there's, there's meaningful sort of opportunity this year. Uh, I think if you take a sort of longer term view, probably over the medium term, you know, we think this business has the opportunity to grow sort of 15 to 20% per annum compound for, for, you know, at least over the medium term. And balance sheet looks incredibly healthy. Plenty of room to potentially have bolt-on acquisitions either in the States or in the US? Yeah, look. Sorry, in, in Australia? Yeah. No, I think there's opportunities in both uh, Australia and in the US. Australia, um, you know, where they've made opportunity, uh, sorry, acquisitions in recent times has been in the strata management space, uh, where they're now the second largest strata manager. Uh, it's a huge market, roughly I think 2.9 million sort of units within that space. They've only got 90,000, so I think there's you know quite a long sort of tail of opportunity for them to make acquisitions within that space. Uh, and in the U.S., look, I think certainly. Um, Given the size of the market, um, sort of plenty of opportunities there as well. But knowing the business, you know, I think they will be quite sort of measured with regards to, to making an acquisition. And first and foremost, it's making sure that you know they're comfortable with the culture within the businesses you know that they're looking at. And I think that will be the main sort of factor before deciding to pull the trigger. It's hard to find good businesses that have good organic growth opportunities in the current climate. So it's a, it's a great one to walk through and thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thanks very much, Chris. Thanks, Chris. This episode of Talk Your Book was proudly brought to you by Honan, who go beyond a transactional insurance broker to deliver better outcomes for their clients. If you're enjoying Talk Your Book, make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.